when we are officially. Okay, hello and welcome to day four of death journaling in real life. I have a wonderful guest today, my friend Gabby, and I'm thrilled to share any time with her and especially today. We just got to catch up for a couple minutes and we're both just brewing exciting things into the world and our shared mutual respect is something that I really treasure. So welcome Gabby. Thank you for being here with me. Thank you for having and me. And Gabby, yes. So Gabby is a hospice nurse and a death doula and an educator trainer and a speaker and an author. Anything else you want to add to that? I'm a grandma, <laughs> which is kind of appropriate since your, your memory lane book was really about that as well with my kids. So I'm a, I'm a lot yeah. of things. You certainly are. And you mean a lot to a lot of people, including me. I loved seeing what the work that you did with your granddaughters, with my map of memory lane, the activity book, it just meant the world and seeing, you know, creating something and with hopes that it might be beneficial, meaningful, useful in the world. And then seeing it be put into practice, be taken into like, this is called into real life and what that looks like and what that means it's just it's amazing so thank you so much for doing that it still is um I treasure those photos and the work that you did and your willingness to share that with other people well it was my pleasure so welcome everybody let us know where you are zooming in from it's lovely to see people here and hello to people in Facebook land as well I want to talk about how we first got connected. So I know we've been connected in a number of ways for a number of years, but do you recall our original interaction, Gabby? I think it must have been, when did you write the Cultivating the Doula Heart? 2018. Okay, so it was definitely around then because it was your book that made me want to be a doula. And so oh. I thought, yeah, so I, I sent you, I think like a Facebook message or something saying, I really loved your book and you were so nice. You wrote me back. And then I thought I was kind of fancy because you wrote me back. And then we kind of talked over Facebook for a while and we became Facebook friends and we would like each other's things. And then you shared with me, I think even before it really even was out there about the map of memory lane. And you told me about it. I said, oh my gosh, this is wonderful. I shared with you that I have granddaughters and how my granddaughters would, you know, this is so important because I talk to them all the time about death and dying. And I really try to have that open conversation with them. And then I got to work with you on the book and, and having my granddaughters try it out and see what it was like. And, and I think our friendship really started there. And since then, of course, I got to watch you make this book and bring this into the world, but you've also been a guest speaker in my classes multiple times. I think we're like, we're on the same page together and we're watching each other grow and evolve in this work. And um, I'm connected to your spirit and your passion for this work. And I think of you as a friend. I love that. And I feel like we are kindred. You know, mm. we have a shared similar mission and passion and I love the collaborative spirit that you bring to this work. It's just, it's reflective of my interpretation of the doula heart, your interpretation of the hospice heart. I mean, it all blends together so beautifully. Thank you for I taking agree. us down memory lane. I appreciate that. You're very welcome. So um, welcome to more people that are coming in. It's lovely to see you wondering how you are connected to us, connected to me through maybe courses, classes, books, or to Gabby through her amazing community that she's developed with the hospice heart or some of her trainings or books. So let us know in the chat how we are connected. It's always fun to learn that. And also feel free to talk about what you're doing in the world and how you're bringing your heart into your work or into your personal lives. Always love to hear that. So Gabby, what I'm asking people who I'm, I'm having uh, join me for these sessions is I, I want to hear how death journaling is, is being brought into real life. So you carry so many hats that I admire as a nurse and as a doula, as a 
family member, grandmother. So how are you envisioning bringing some of these concepts from the book into the world? Well, first of all, this book is fantastic. Um, I think you, you quoted me here on the front page where I said, I, I wish I'll read this because I think it's what I would say. I wish I had this when I was a young adult. And I wonder if someone had helped me dig deep into my own curiosities back then, would I have lived my life more fully? And, and I think about this in life in general, how, how poignant things would be if we talked about it more, of course, but what if we wrote our, our thoughts down and let them evolve over the years of our life and then get to the place of where maybe we're dying at the end and, and look back and reflect and say, did we, did we do that? Did we go there? Did we feel this? You have some, this book is fantastic. You know, I promote it all the time in my classes because I think it's really important that we have, that we take the time to, to write. You know, I, in my classes, I teach people all the time to not type, but to use a pen and paper, because when you use a pen and paper, there's no backspace or delete. You have given people the opportunity to write, like you've got multiple pages where they can, you know, it's, it's your reflections and your setting intentions and to be able to take notes and you've got these perfectly placed note pages so that people can reflect on what they've read. But there's also some other things in here, which I really love, like, you guys, I have tons of little stickers, so bear with me. Uh, on, on page 27, it's about listening intently. And there's this mindful mantra. I love these words. My truth is legitimate. My words are testimony. As I was reading through this, I was thinking this book makes you think about who you are, who you've been, how far you've come, where you're going, and how you want to be remembered, and what your legacy will be, and how you will honor your life for the time that you are gifted. So I have a couple pages marked if it's okay. I wanna, I love chapter four, Memento Mori. I've heard that a million times, had no idea what that meant. It remember, remember death. I love that. I, I love the, the, the moments, the reflections, the, the way that you have everything played out that's, it offers clarity. And, and if you have confusion about the process of just anticipating death or dying or an illness, this guides you along that. It's, it's so beautiful. But my favorite chapter of all is, it's part four on page 83, processing, exploring what feels unfinished and undiscovered. And the reason I like that is because the thing that I witness most at the bedside is people who are reflecting back on what they haven't said or done and thinking of all the things that have, is unfinished and the things that never got said or done. There's this moment of that. And I think if we all had this book that we would and did it early, like right now for me, I'm doing it right now, is to be able to say, okay. I, I still have some stuff I want to do while I can, and I'm going to do it, right? But you also talk about things like, you know, making sure that you practice self-care. And, and on page 95, the Dear Me letter, like, what if we wrote a Dear Me letter all the time, like once a year, right? We reread the previous year and then wrote a new one just to see where we've got. If we had that, it's almost like, kind of like your map of memory lane in many ways and where we what if we created using this book a map of our life now and how we hope it will be and then reflect on it over the years if we're gifted the years so for me this book is an opportunity to remember you know who you are where you've been where you what you've done and and to maybe motivate you to do the things you've always thought of doing, which could just simply be be more present in your life. And, and you've got some wonderful meditation exercises in here, some, some supportive guides, some, you know, some explanations. I love this book. Thank you so much for that. It's amazing to sort of see my book through someone else's eyes and to be able to hear, you know, what kind of stood out to you and what popped up to you. And it just makes me so happy to know that it's being infused into some of the teaching that you're doing and some of what you're offering. And it's such an honor. It's such a privilege to know that. And I want it to be put to use. 
And like you said, it's it's very customizable too. And I don't want for people to think that when you hear legacy, sometimes that can feel like pressure. You know, I have have I changed the world? You know, is there a museum named after me or a monument or something? It doesn't have to be that way. I mean, we can live really simply and make an impact in our day-to-day -day kindness that we offer to ourselves and to others and to the world and to animals and to the the missions and goals that we hold in our own hearts. You know, that those are the components of a meaningful life. And it does take courage to pause and reflect. It definitely is a brave act to think about, you know, what is unfinished, what has been left unsaid, and what we could heal. But as you know so well, when we just sort of accumulate that throughout the years, because it's inevitable. I mean, relationships are complex and the fates, you know, throw challenges in our paths. And if we don't regularly attend to that, it's going to build up. And then it tends to catch up with us at the end, especially when we know time is short, when death is anticipated, when we have a terminal illness, it really does seem like all those things that we tried to bury and maybe pretend away and forget about tend to rise back up to the surface. And that can be really emotional work that takes a lot of energy and energy supplies are dwindling at that time so it's not ideal to kind of jump into it so if we can in some regular interval interval be checking in with ourselves and our lives and our relationships and making sure that our priorities feel like they're in alignment with who we are and what we're hoping for then that we're getting the support we need we're getting those listening ears and we're able to try expressive writing and journaling and seeking professional support, counseling, support groups, whatever we need so that we can live our fullest lives while we're able to. You know, you brought up legacy and I think you're right. I think people think that legacy means that you're going to be remembered for some big thing. He, he discovered the this, you know, but I think it's more than that. And, and I feel that for myself and, and this has changed over the years since I became a, a Nana, a grandma, um, you know, what I want to do is live the kind of life that my children would be proud of. You know, that's what I want my legacy to be. I want them to say, my Nana did this. You know, I, I, you've probably heard of the Humane Prison Project, the Humane Prison Hospice Project. Well, I'm one of the facilitators and I had my first day the other day, which is being at the prison and working with the inmates and handing over our tools to help them provide end of life care to other inmates. And I, I just was so full being there and watching what they're, they're doing for other inmates, right? They are holding hands and offering comfort and, and just being so present for people who are dying. At the end of the class, one of them came up to me to thank me for being there. And he said, you know, I have a son and my son, um, he talks about what I do. And, and that matters so much because I don't want him to talk about what I did. He made mistakes. He's done some stuff. I've done some stuff. But what he wants his son to remember him for is something good. And so when, when it is his time to die, he feels so much peace in his heart because his, his son will say, my dad was a good man. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's our, our legacy is not big things. It's having pride in who you are and what you can offer the world. And if one person takes from that and maybe makes a better decision or does better for themselves, that's your legacy. Yeah, and that's everything. And so much of that tends to boil down to connection. It's just everything in my mind. The connection that you're talking about as you think about your family, your children, your grandchildren, that person who's incarcerated, his son, you know, that connection, like how do we connect? And um, that becomes the impact that we leave behind. And it's just beautiful and it's really powerful. So thank you for sharing that. And thank you for doing that work. I have, obviously I'm on the other, I'm on the East Coast area. So I'm far from the heart of that project, but I just love it. And I've been in contact with the other people who are organizing it. And I mailed out a handful of the Cultivating the Dual Heart books and Map of Memory Lane so that they can be in the prison hospice library 
and my publisher is donating 10 books as well to the project. So it's just I love that. incredibly important. And as we often talk about, you know, this is human work when we're supporting other people through their final phase, it's human work. And so being able to recognize that this is happening no matter where people are, including people who are incarcerated and that we need all to take people, good care. Yeah. All humans. And I, you know, we all, our collaboration, our community that we have, the, the death workers, the death friends, you know, I, my goal is always to help improve the way people are cared for when they die. And, and in that saying, there is nowhere does it say, but not these people, mm -hmm. right? And only these people. It doesn't work that way. From my heart and, and probably everyone here, it's about all people. All human beings deserve to have peace at the end of their life and to that their landing is soft and that they they find that, you know, and, and we do that as doulas, as nurses, as, as anyone really who provides end of life care, even, even the wife of a husband who's dying, that is providing care and to be present for someone in that way and to hold space for them in that way. It's all human beings, whether you've made bad choices or not. We shouldn't be selective on how we care, how or who we care for at the end of life. Yeah, and I certainly have that on my mind, and I have no doubt you have it on yours that, you know, some of the educational opportunities that I have developed there, I I developed programs at the University of Vermont, which I'm very proud of. I work at part of the Art of Dying Institute's team for their thanatology program. I teach sort of one-off workshops and give talks and things. Now, some of those offerings are not feasible for everyone. Not everyone can afford to invest in a program like that. So my aim with some of my written work is to make sure that it is accessible to people, that they are able to have this information that they can put to good use, no matter what their goal is. If they're a death care worker, wonderful. They can stock their doula bag or their hospice bag. If they're a family caregiver, amazing. Here's what you can do. I mean, it's really applicable to all mortals. And I recognize and understand that for some people, doling out hundreds of dollars is not an option for them. So making sure that, you know, 10, 15, my publisher price this is $25, it's a bigger, wider book, workbook, you know, is more accessible to more people so that we can really promote this idea of death literacy so that we can remember what it is to be mortal. And we have more of a frame of reference because I imagine for you as a hospice nurse, especially so much of what you're doing when you come into the home is teaching people what to expect, you know, and to normalize the process because a lot of people don't know and that creates a lot of fear, right? I think that when someone is given a, a terminal diagnosis, it's almost like they're sent out to fend for themselves. There's so much uncertainty, so much unknown, so many fears. And I, I teach this hospice masterclass, right? And I, I do charge for it. I think the price is pretty fair, but I, mm -hmm. you know, I always offer a scholarship spot or two or three. I never want money to stop someone from joining. Well, last week I decided to just host a free one, right? Because I wanted to hand over those tools. I, I wanted people, all people to have them. There were 130 people signed up and, and wow. that tells me, right. That tells me that people want to learn. They want to know what to do. Some are curious about the work. Maybe they want to do this work, but I think most human beings, when they find themselves at a bedside of someone who's dying, they have absolutely no idea what to do. And well, I, I want to make a career of this. I also want to be able to make sure that they all have the tools that they have some sense of, of confidence at the bedside. And that's what we do, right? And I love that you donated your books to the prison, um, to their hospice library. So many people have, my books are in there, but they it's about giving back. Like if we all just gave back, imagine that just kind of that ripple effect. For me, it's, it's tools. I wanna, I wanna share. I don't, we're not hoarders of this information. And, you know, one of the things that one of the, the men said, he said, and I'm gonna probably say this wrong, but we were talking about the role of what they're doing. So out of the 12 men that I was working with, six have been doing this work for quite some time. And, and some of them have seen more last breaths than me. 
And the other wow. six are, are mentoring towards this. And so I asked the ones that were mentoring the, the new ones. And they said, because when we're gone, we're, we're training them to take over for us. And I thought, that's what I want to do. I want to hand it. I think of Barbara Carnes in that way, right? Like uh, she has taught me so much. I want to, I want to make her proud, right? So I've taken what she has shared so generously. And now I want to do that. And then one day someone can say, you know, I learned from Gabby long after I'm dead. And then I want them to be able to pass that on. If we just continue doing that. And I love the, the philosophy in the prison because they're, they're not looking at forever. They're looking at right now. What can I do right now to make a difference and a contribution, but to also help others? I think we could learn a lot from them. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, I just um, got a beautiful email from Barbara Carnes and her org, and she took the time to read the book and sent over some lovely words. And it just meant so much because like you said, she also has compiled her thoughts and her decades of experience into these really digestible guides that people have benefited from for so long. And she reaches people far and wide. And, you know, they're, they're pretty reasonably priced little booklets and Absolutely. they can change everything about the experience. So the more voices, the more perspectives, you know, the more publications that we can get in this field that only benefits us all. So I, in that spirit, I want to put it out to the crowd here in the chat. What tips do you have? I know we have some practicing death care providers and an array of people who are logging in. I want to know, like, what is one tip that you share with people based on your knowledge from your own personal experiences or professional experiences about the end of life? Not so much advice. I mean, because that's that's a tricky thing. I mean, it could be advice, um, but you know, something that you've learned that you've taken forward, a wisdom nugget that you could share with us and the others that are going to be watching this recording. So feel free to put that in the chat. I'd love to hear it. And in the meantime, I found the page where I quote you in the book. So this is part of the letter to care partners. So using this guidebook as a supportive tool, because I recognize that some people will go through as an individual mortal, and they're going to be working through on their own and at their own pace, or maybe with a friend or a family member or a book club. But other people who are reading this are wanting to use it as a tool. And so I asked you if you could talk about and reflect on your work in the field and how you take care of yourself when you are such a um, a giver of compassion to so many people. So it says that you affirm to provide care for people who are dying and for those who are grieving, we must be at peace with ourselves. We cannot walk alongside someone else when we are riddled with our own grief, pain, physical or emotional, stress or exhaustion. And it's so true. You know, we have to turn inward. We have to work through our own stuff. We have to be able to differentiate, you know, what is mine versus what is someone else's. And, and that is a continued practice. And we have to often revisit and we will get activated as we're working alongside someone. You know, old stuff will come up, old memories, connections to something that feels similar something has sparked a memory in there. And that's really a cue to revisit taking good care of ourselves and doing our own work. So thank you for that addition. Oh, thank you for asking me. Uh, you know, it, it's like they're triggers, right? And I have them all the time. My Both of my parents died when I was in my 20s. Of course, I wasn't a nurse then. And I, I say it often, if I only knew then what I know now, I would have done things differently at their death. And I, I every time I'm at a bedside of, a, a young girl with her father or a young girl with her mother and they're saying goodbye, I have a moment where I can't help but make it about me. And I, I think, gosh, I wish I had this moment. I'm constantly reminded though that their experience is not about me. So I have to, I have to check out for a moment and put that aside. But at the end of the day, when I get in my car, I will probably have a really good cry. But I, at the end of the day, when I get home, I do a candle lighting. I do, you know, I'm big on, and your book mentions this too, about ceremony and ritual. Ritual is very important to me. So I have a, a ritual that I do often 
very differently. One ritual is to honor the person who has died in my care. The other is to honor those who said goodbye. But I also have a ritual for myself when I am triggered by an experience that brings up emotions that have been tucked inside. And so I think it's important to honor that. Of course, we, we all talk about self-care and finding balance, but what works for you? For me, it's doing rituals to honor my feelings and the people. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we have Eileen in here referencing some of your ritual workshops. And I know that I have benefited from some of your rituals in your workshops when I've been able to attend them. And even if they're simple, even if they are less than five minutes, they can really shift your perspective and, and really bolster your ability to heal and grow versus to feel so much pain and heaviness. And that is huge in terms of not becoming so exhausted by our work that we end up burning out. I mean, we have so much to offer the world and the world has so much need. And so in order for us to stay energized, that's really a good part of it. So if anybody wants to mention anything else in the chat about what you do to take care of yourself, how you keep yourself energized, please feel free. Because when we share our ideas, then we inspire one another to continue down this path. So well, in our last couple of minutes, Gabby, I wanted to ask you if there's anything you want to share about in terms of what's lighting you up currently in your life, projects, events? Uh, well, there's, you know, this month has been really, really good for me um, personally and emotionally and even spiritually and that I've gotten to do some really good work. I've had two opportunities to speak to different communities. One was the Duchesne community, which is muscular dystrophy. And then also I spoke to the um, LA County Women's Caucus on HIV, which I got to speak to women who are grieving someone who has died from HIV or who is navigating that journey and to really hear from them. And then doing this prison project all of this reminds me that we're all going through something and, and that we have to build community and support one another. But I do have something new that's coming up and I this is the first time I'm really announcing it. Um, I have a new book, it's called End of Life Tips and it's so pretty. It's I love it so much, I haven't promoted it. It is on Amazon now but I haven't physically seen it yet. So it's coming today. I get to put it in my hands. I get to make sure it's everything I want it to be. And then I'll, I'll put out the big promotion. It is on Amazon, but um, it's such a beautiful work. I, I actually want to share something. If I, Do I have a minute? Yes, please. Okay. I and I cannot wait to check out your new book. I'm so it's excited. It's so pretty. I love everything about it. But what I want to share is that this book is special. It's different than my other four. Not that they're not special. I love them, of course. This one is, is colorful and pretty. It's just a book on end of life tips. Well, I priced it lower than my other books because I want it to be affordable, but I priced it at $11. And this is why I want to read you this. Um, I priced it. The number 11 can symbolize a spiritual awakening. The name of this number is sometimes the illuminator or the teacher. It is here to encourage positive thinking and the powers of manifestation and to recognize and use your unique skills to give something back to the world. Oh, and 11 so, has always been my favorite number. <laughs> well, there you see, you're a perfect activist for Isn't that. It? I, I love so I, that. That's kind of where my brain went with this book. I want to make it a little easier for people to afford. I want to make it full of tools and tips that'll make life easier for them when they're caring for someone who's dying. And I love the idea of giving back to the world. So if someone takes a tip from there and gives it to someone else, we're continually giving back. Oh, I'm so excited for you. Congratulations. And I can't wait to see it. And I know everyone else will be so psyched to add that to their bookshelf as well. All right, well, thank you everyone for joining us on Facebook and here on Zoom. It's been a pleasure as always. We had Lapika had mentioned that she grounds outside, hydrates journals and connects with uplifting friends. So let that be a reminder to us all to go out and take good care of ourselves. I have one more mini session tomorrow, which is a solo session and I'm gonna be focusing on 
adding to our conversation that we started today, Gabby, about putting this workbook to good use. And I really want for death care providers and family caregivers, people to feel empowered to use what I have supplied here and rework it in any ways that they need to in order to do more networking and community education and one-on-one -on -one work with clients and even more than that, group experiences, workshops. So I'm gonna be giving my tips for what I've learned in terms of um, holding space for individuals and groups as they work through this type of education because it's a sensitive topic and it requires a lot of sensitivity as a facilitator. And so that's what I'm gonna be offering tomorrow at noon. So I hope people come back and join for that last one, but this has been such a pleasure and I can't thank you enough, Gabby. Thank you for having me. It's so nice to have you all here. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye.